got a great message here talking about right here, dreaming big, dream big. How many of you are dreaming big? All right, 12, praise God. <laughs> Jesus changed the world with 12. I guess we'll get there. No, on a serious note, I just believe that we as believers should be dreaming big. We should be dreaming big. And apparently y'all need this message. All right? You should be dreaming big. I believe that our God is big and he does big things and he uses little people to do big things. Amen. Amen. So if you feel like you're one of those little people, well, praise God. I do too, praise God. Listen, I believe that God wants to receive a lot of glory and because of that, he can use us to get it. Isn't that right? So, so what's your dream? We've been talking about it over the last several weeks. I just believe you should have a dream. You should have something you're believing for. And I believe this doesn't pertain to a certain level of life in the sense of age or how long you've been on this planet. It has nothing to do with that. I believe you should be living for something. There should be some reason you're living. Uh, matter of fact, I will tell you that I believe that most people die. Um, well, some people. We won't say most. Some people die because they just give up. They just give up on living. And they live, give up on a dream. So I want to ask you, what's your dream today? What's your dream? Because you should have a dream. You should have something on the inside that's moving you, moving you towards something. So in light of that, I'm going to give you a little bit to do with that. You ready? Listen to Ephesians 3.19. This is probably one of my favorite Bible verses. I kid you not. Probably one of my favorite. Maybe the favorite, but I don't want to say that because i got a bunch of them. But here's what it says. And um, this is the Amplified Bible, and I, and I like it because it goes deep. It says, now to him who is able to carry on, look, look, carry out, I'm sorry, carry out his purpose and do, here it is, super abundantly. Does that not sound like a word that I made up? I love that word, super abundantly. I mean, why didn't I think of that when I, would, when I was naming the church? You know what I mean? We're called Abundant Life Church. We're called the Abundant Life Church, by the way. That's the way the TV, pro, TV uh, said it. But, but we are the Abundant Life Church. Now, in light of that, let me just say this. Why wouldn't I think in the Super Abundant Life Church? I know it sounds a little wordy, and I'll tell you why we didn't go with it. Because if you, if you take and put super in front of abundant, then in the phone book, we would have been under the S's instead of the A's. How many of you remember phone books? How many of you don't know what a phone book is? <laughs> We're just aging people here, you know what I mean? Some kids are like, I remember one time Michelle and I, we were talking to our niece, and she was like, you know, get your phone out. Michelle was talking about taking pictures, and my niece said, well, just get your phone, get your phone. Well, and we were talking about pictures like 25 years ago. Why didn't you have your phone? <laughs> We had to explain to our niece that phones didn't have the ability to take pictures 20 years ago. Come on, amen? Amen. amen. How many of you remember those good days? <laughs> we didn't have any of that. But anyway, here's what it says. God is able, and I love this. It says, to him who is able to do super abundantly. <laughs> yeah, I like that. More than all that we dare ask or think. I mean, do you guys realize how big our God is? That he can do more than we ask or think. Look at the next part. It says, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, and dreams. Infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, and dreams. I love that because here's what it's really saying. It's saying your dreams are the platform from which you launch where God stops and he starts. He can do more than you dream. But if you never dream, he can never take you more. Y'all get what I'm saying? That's the platform. That's the level. I want to make sure I have a dream because I know that if God can do more than I dream, I want to make sure my dreams are out there. I want to make sure that my hopes are out there. I want to make sure that my prayers are out there. So that I'm believing because I know if he only meets my hopes, my prayers, my dreams, my goodness, he can do more than that. How many of you know that's a super abundant life? Super abundant. You know where I got that? Yeah. Anyway, it goes, according to his power that is work with, come on, it's where at? 
Come on, everybody say, it's in me. It's in me. Yeah, that power's in me. See, so what are you believing for? What, what is the platform from which you're giving God to say, God, this is where I know you're going to start. He's going to start with my dreams, my hopes, my prayers. What are my prayers, my hopes, my dreams? And then he's going to take it from there and go to the next level. Or at least that's my opinion. I think that's where God starts. I think that's where God starts to meet me. Because he's got big dreams for me and he's got big dreams for you. Amen? Mm -hmm, for sure. I love what John Maxwell says. He says this. He says, a dream is an inspiring picture. Notice that. It's something, it's a picture. It's an inspiring pi picture of the future that energizes your mind, your will, and your emotions. Look at this. Empowering you to do everything you can to achieve it. Allowing you to do everything you can to achieve it. What's the picture that drives you on the inside? Do you have something? Do you have something on the inside that moves you? That, that you're progressing towards? I love that definition. What, what, what could you do? What could you do that if no one showed up and no one paid you, no one even asked you to do it, you just do it? And it's something that really brings fulfillment in you. You know? Because that's your dream. What moves you in that way? I think it's awesome. Listen to Proverbs 13, 12. It says this. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Look at that. If you don't live out your dream... It makes your heart sick. Hope deferred, hope deferred makes your heart sick. But when dreams come true, at last, there's life and there is joy. Come on, can anybody get with that? I mean, when, you, when you've been moving towards something and you're believing for something and then finally, boom, that thing breaks open, you're like, oh, praise God, praise God. It's finally happening. You know, but can I tell you, you can't give up on your dream. Can't give up on it. You got to keep believing. I will tell you this. I believe there are a whole lot of sick people. And I, and I mean that physically, emotionally, psychologically. They're sick because they've given up on their dream. They've given up on their dream. And the reality is if you give up on your dream, it'll make you sick. Make you sick. It will. Man, I think about, you know, what it would be like if I wasn't pursuing my dream. I don't know what I'd live for. I really don't. You don't live just to eat. Well, some of us do sometimes, you know, Saturday night, not preaching. Might as well. You know what I mean? But, but you don't live to make money. I mean, you don't live to just this or just that. Come on, life's more than that. Living to pursue your dream, man. Living the dream. Living the dream. I love that, though. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. I see that a lot. People are just sick because they, they just don't dream. And they don't want to walk in their dream. I believe this, though. When it comes to pass, though, oh, there's life and there's joy. Listen to this next. This is another Proverbs verse. It says, it is pleasant to see dreams come true. Yeah, it is. But fools refuse to turn their evil to attain them. Now, I know what the verse is saying, but I want to take a little bit of liberty here. It's saying that an evil person won't change their ways to get their dreams to come to pass in their life. Can I tell you, honestly, I don't believe that just pertains to evil people. I believe that pertains to all people. That if you're wanting something and you're wanting to pursue a dream, but you're not willing to change the way you're thinking or change the way you're living, change the way you're acting. How many of you know you'll never get that dream in your life? Isn't that right? Yeah. You got to change the way you think. Got to change the way your mind processes it. The, the reality is it is pleasant when dreams come true, but fools or people that think it's just going to happen by accident think they don't have to change anything. Can I assure you of this? For your dreams to take place in your life, you're going to have to change some things. You're going to have to change some things, no doubt. Matter of fact, I like to say it this way. Every God-given dream will have opposition. Every God-given dream is going to have opposition. Every God-given dream. Everything. You think about it like this. Even the children of Israel had opposition in everything that they did. And it was God, but they had opposition. Jesus going to the cross had opposition. Jesus dying for our sins had opposition. The Apostle Paul preaching had opposition. 
Everybody that has a God-given dream is going to see opposition in it. And there's, it's a guarantee. Don't think that the devil's just going to back up and go, oh, yeah, let you do whatever you want to do because you got a dream. How many, of you know, how many of you know that the enemy is going to resist? He's going to set up every obstacle he can. Yeah. How many of you know, though, you just keep on dreaming the dream? You just keep on pressing forward, praise God, knowing that God has better days and better things ahead. And I'm not going to let the enemy frustrate or people frustrate me or any of the enemies of my dream frustrate me. Amen? I was thinking about it this way. Uh, what are some of the enemies of our dreams? And now I will be honest with you, I grabbed four out of my mindset, but, but there are probably 20,000. But I'm going to give you four just real quick of things that are enemies to your dream. And these are people or things that you must separate yourself from to live out your dream. So here's number one, and I believe this one's true, boy. This is negativity. Negativity. People that, surround you, that, that are around you, well, I, it can't be done. I just don't even know why you're trying. I, I, just, I just don't think you should do that. I just don't think, hey, listen, everything, you ever gonna, everything you've ever wanted to do for God is going to have people that oppose you. And listen, and sometimes negativity is, is hidden not even in people that are against you. Let me, let me give you an example. And again, this is not a slam on anyone, but when I was in Bible college, I went to a pastor that I highly respected, and I said, hey, listen, I think I'm, I think I'm going to start a church, and I'm going to start with a service on Sunday night. And he looked right at me. He goes, nobody starts a church on Sunday night. <laughs> I mean, you know, I did. <laughs> yeah. And, and here's the truth. Don't allow what other people say and maybe even their negative experience or, or ideas to influence your dream. It's your dream, right? So I followed my heart and I respected his opinion and still to this day, he's a friend of mine and I respect him and I, and I honor him and he's a good dude, loves God. He, I, but I have to follow my dream. I'm not going to allow negativity and negative people to surround me. And, and again, I, this man is not a negative person. He was just giving me the reality of it. But how many of you know what God speaks to you is different than everybody else's reality? Yeah. 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 I'll give you a little bit of that on, on, on the back side. But you get the idea. Here's the second one I believe is a huge hindrance to a lot of people living out their dream. Simply fear. They're just fearful. They're fearful. Listen to this. This is uh, Isaiah 41. It says this, fear not for I am with you. Now, why would God say fear not? Because there was a reason to fear. Hello? How I many of you know you don't need to hear fear not unless there's a reason to be fearful? When God told the children of Israel, hey, you know, hey, go in and take the promised land. Fear not. When they got there, there were giants. How many of you know they got their eyes on their problems instead of their God? They put their eyes on their problem instead of the promises of God. Amen. Preach on, Pastor Charlie. I will. Thank you. I lay hands on myself, pray over myself, <laughs> fall out on myself, take up an offering all by myself, <laughs> preach to myself, whatever. <laughs> Come on, amen. That's for sure. Here's the, here's the reality. Fear not. Fear will rob you. I love the acronym False evidence appearing real. I love that acronym. False evidence appearing real. What, what are things in your life that you're fearful of? And because of that, you just don't step out in faith. You know, for years, how many of you know I love to fish and hunt and all that good stuff, all right? Okay, nobody. <laughs> but I wanted for years to, to go out and fish in bass tournaments. But do you know why I didn't? Because I didn't have the best brand new boat. And I got a nice boat, all right? But I didn't have a brand spanking new boat. Because of fear, I wouldn't go out and participate in a bass tournament because I was embarrassed about my boat. My boat's fine. <laughs> and it wasn't until I showed up to a bass tournament that I realized, hey, there are other people that don't have even half of what I have. <laughs> what were you fearful of? See, it's false evidence. It's not even real. It's not even real. It's not even tangible. It's something that you've made up in your mind that's hindering you from chasing the dream that God has for you. Come on, amen? amen. Don't allow those things to hinder you. You just keep walking, man. Keep, keep moving. Keep moving. Do you know why a lot of people do? Don't live out their dream, especially with fear, is because they want security. 
They want to feel secure in everything that they do. Helen Keller said this, and I think it's true. Listen to this. Security is a myth. It really is a myth. The reason we don't experience it is because it doesn't exist. Avoiding danger or failure. You, you, you don't want to be in danger. You don't want to, be, uh, you don't want to fail. Is no safer in the long run than outright risk. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. Come on, how many of you get that? Well, Pastor Charlie, you know, I don't, I, I'm trying to find that mate, but I just, I just don't know. Okay, are you dating? No, I'm fear. <laughs> Come on, man. You're going to have to, well, you think God's just going to drop her down in your front room? She's going to skydive in <laughs> like Santa? Put out cookies and milk, she'll show up? <laughs> Hello? It doesn't work that way. How many of you know that? Here's the next one. And this one, I even struggle with this one to a degree. How about this one? Self-doubt. Yeah. How many of you have self-doubt? You doubt yourself all the time. You know what I mean? I will tell you as a pastor, this is one of the biggest things that I have to deal with all the time. You have self-doubt. Self-doubt. You just question in yourself, am, am I good enough? Am I qualified? Should I be doing this? I mean, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? What? it it's just self-doubt. Self-doubt, and it's, it's constantly rolling on the inside of you. It used to bother me, and I'm, there, I'm very honest about this whenever I tell you. When the church got to be above 50 people, <laughs> which was years ago, I mean, you know what I mean? I, I, I was struggling. I was like, 50 people. It's like, oh, no, I don't know what I'm doing. And then, you know, 500, then 1,000, then 1,500. I mean, as it's gone up, every, at every level, I'm like, huh, I don't know what I'm doing. What am I doing? What am, I, am I called to do this? Maybe God needs somebody different because I don't know about all this. You know, I, I mean, serious. And it bothered me, and it used to really, really bother me. Then one time I went to a conference, and uh, the, the Andy Stanley was there and Craig Rochelle there. And Craig, uh, Craig Rochelle was actually the one speaking about this. And he got up there, and it was in a pastor's time where we had a pastor's breakout session and got to ask him questions and talk to these guys. And while we were doing that, he was talking about how when his church got to be about 15,000, 15,000 people, you know, that they were breaking in. At that point in time, they had like 12 to 15 campuses or something like that. And he goes, and I got to where, you know, I didn't feel I was adequate to lead this thing. And I didn't know if I was the man to lead it and all that stuff. And I'm thinking, oh my word, sounds like he's got the same issues I got going on. You know what I mean? Now, granted, it's a different level, but the reality is everyone deals with self-doubt. And you're just gonna have to, you're just gonna have to grow through it and go through it and realize, you know what? Hey, listen, I may doubt myself, but God has enough faith and confidence in me that I can walk in this thing, and if God called me to it, I can do it, praise God. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So you can't constantly doubt yourself and experience the dream because self-doubt always puts you in a place where you're backwards. Now, let me tell you what self-doubt does do. This is the positive thing of self-doubt. The reason I know I can't do this by myself is the reality of at 50, I was feeling like I couldn't do this. So, so watch this. What does it cause you to do? Go to God. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, I can't do this without you. Oh, God, you need to speak to my heart. Oh, God, you need to lead me. Come on, somebody. It, it creates in you a sense of humility that says, God, I can't do it without you. And really what it causes you to be is dependent upon God more than you. And listen, if that's what self-doubt does, if that's the positive thing that self-doubt does in my heart, I'm sure it does it the same way in your heart. And if for that, it is a good thing. I didn't say it was a godly thing. I said it's a good thing. That it causes me to go to God and say, God, I need you to help me with this. Amen? Because I don't know what I'm doing. I do to a degree. Everybody does. Now, listen to this. Here's the last one. Procrastination. This is an enemy of you living the dream that God has for you. Procrastination. And I'll tell you, probably more than self-doubt, the one that gets me is procrastination. I'm, I, I will sit there and wait till the last minute. I will push things back. I know, like in my world, one of the things I want to do right now over this... I'm trying to write a book. I'm trying to get my book written. You know what I mean? And, and here's the truth. Procrastination. I got other, th everybody's busy. I'm busy. You're busy. Everybody's busy. The reality is sometimes that we just keep procrastinating and procrastinating because of that. We don't get to live our dream. That's the reality. I love what Proverbs says 
Proverbs 90, 12 says this. So teach us, Lord, to number our... Stop right there, everybody. Look at me. Here's the reality. You only have so many days to live on this planet. Take advantage of it. Because when it's all said and done, it can't be a life of I wish I could have, should have deal. Because in the end, it doesn't matter. All that matters is what you did get done. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So, so I could live for the next five years and say, yeah, I'm going to write a book some point in time. But you know what? I keep procrastinating, and you know what? I'll never get it done. I'm just going to have to take it and sacrifice and do whatever it takes to make it happen. Amen? Amen. 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 See, I just think the bottom line is you have to stay away from dream crushers and dream killers. Amen. Stay away. Uh, I got a story for you. Check this out. Uh, year, year, several years ago, and I want to say my daughter was probably 18, 19 years old, okay? So she was about 18 or 19, which puts Michael two years behind that. And uh, I don't know where we were at, but I don't know about you guys as a family, but in our family, we love to go out and we go out to eat. We a lot of times get chips and salsa or chips and cheese dip. Amen. Come on, any real Americans here that still do that? Praise God. All right. You know? So, so we, we, we would go out and uh, we, we'd get chips and salsa and whatever. So one day we were sitting there. It was so funny. So we were sitting there. Michael and I are on one side. Whitney and Michelle are on the other side. And we're eating and we're having these chips. And it's before our meal comes out. Whitney is over there and she's telling us everything she wants to do. And I'll be honest with you, very honest with you. I don't remember the context. I don't remember what she was passionate about. Would you happen to remember? No. Uh, she was passionate about it, though. And she's, she's Dad, here's what I'm going to do. Mom, here's what I'm going to do. Ba, 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 And Michael is, you know, 17, 18, whatever, and 16. And he's old enough to register what is re real and what isn't real. <laughs> now, in his world, uh, y'all y'all picking up what I'm putting down. <laughs> Smell what I'm cooking. Okay, so, so here we are, and we're sitting there, and Whitney's just going about it. You know, she's telling him, she's fired up, man. She's going, she's going to do this, she's going to do that, she's going to do this. And I, me as a father, I'm just taking it in, and Michelle's taking it in. And finally, she's eating these chips. She gets done. Michael goes, well, I don't think that's going to happen because, and he starts I mean, just slamming it, like, this is reason one, and this is reason two, this is reason three. I mean, he's just blam, 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 blam. I kid you not, my daughter, and if you don't, she's a sweethearted girl, man. She's eating her chips, right? She grabs this chip, and she's holding it just like this, and Michael's just going off. Finally, he gets done, and she goes, really, Mike? This is what she says. She goes... She puts the chip in her hand and crushes it. She goes, dream crusher. <laughs> Just like that, man. Just like that. So, so in our home, we know what dream crusher means. You know? And Michael's notorious for it because you can rattle off all these things you're going to do. It. He'll look at you and go, no, you ain't. Blah, 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 blah. And so he got the phrase dream crusher out of that. It's so funny. It, it cracks me up even to this day thinking about it because my do how many of you know we don't typically eat chips and crush them in our hand? <laughs> but man, she was just she, dream crusher. Can I tell you, you got to stay away from dream crushers. Amen. Even if it's your son. <laughs> Even if it's your son, praise God. Why? Here's why. Here's why. Let me tell you why. You ready? Here's the reality. And I, and I wrote this out because I want you to see it, all right? Some people don't understand what you have been called to do. That's why you've been called to do it. Not everybody understands what you've been called to do. Don't expect them to understand what you're doing. I remember uh, there's so many examples of this in my life. Um, starting the church was one. How many of you know we put in a road back here? All right? Now, now, in light of that road, by the way, they've asked that if you would leave that way today, it would help with the slick roads. But let me just go on. Whenever we first had the idea of we're going to buy up these properties and we're going to build a road that, so people can egress, can, do, believe it or not, I had someone call that was concerned because here's all they heard. 
Pastor Charlie's buying up properties and putting in roads. <laughs> like we're the church that puts in roads. That's what we do. And they, and they called. And it was a business leader within the community. And they were concerned because they heard Pastor Charlie was putting in roads. All right? Now, let, let's be real. Okay? They've never been here. They don't know anything about our church. They don't know anything about our business. They don't know anything. All they did was hear Pastor Charlie's buying up properties put in a road. Okay? So they called me up. They're concerned. Hey, heard you're buying up properties put in a road. Yep, we are. Well, I mean, what's the deal? And really what I wanted to say was, well, I've always dreamed of having a road. <laughs> How many of you know that'd be a little bit smart aleck? <laughs> you know what I mean? But that, how many of you know, listen, so I took the time, and I was very polite. I took the time to explain, hey, listen, here's the deal. Number one, whenever they came in and created this bypass, they created an environment where they made our road a dead-end road. So now we only have one egress out of our facility and over the whole block here. And so because of that, I'm buying up property so I can get to the county road so that whenever people leave our church, they can get out without worrying about getting out on the state road 26 and, and all that. And I explained it all to them. Well, in the end of the conversation, they were like, oh, well, that makes sense. Well, thank you. Uh, okay, now, and again, I was polite and they were polite and it's all good and I'm not mad because they asked and called and were concerned. But here's the truth, you ready? I'm not worried about what other people think. I, I'm really not. See, they don't understand what I've been called to do, so therefore, that is why I've been called to do it. The fact that you understand, don't understand explains everything to me as to why I've been called to do it and you haven't. Because I understand why we're doing what we're doing. Come on, somebody. I mean, have you ever looked at anything in your life and go, I know exactly what to do there. And what will happen is because you know exactly what to do, chances are God's called you to fix that problem. You know what I mean? Now, now. So, so don't be worried about people looking at it and going, well, I don't know why they're doing that. Well, you haven't been called to do what they do. If you'd have been called to do what they do, you would have the same insight that they have, and it would make sense in your world. Come on, that's good, y'all. And the reason I say that, how many people have cut their dreams off in their life because somebody said, well, I don't know why you'd ever do that. And then they say, well, that's just silly for me to do that then. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I mean, I think about all the silly commercials that I see. Seen one just the other day. Guy cut out the bottom of his boat and put some plastic tape over the bottom of the aluminum boat. Okay? Now, to me, why would you do that? Why would you cut the bottom out of your boat and put in plastic? But they did it to prove a point to show how strong the plastic is. Like everybody's going to cut up their boat and put plastic on the bottom of the boat. And listen, I don't trust that stuff. Preach on, Pastor Charlie. But here's the truth. I haven't been called to make duct tape. Come on, y'all. Isn't that right? I'm so glad I haven't either, all right? So here's the deal. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you a dream test real quick. I'm not going to expound too much on these. You can get these on the app and on our notes. But I'm going to give you a dream test, all right? And in this dream test, I just want you to answer the question real quick, yay or nay? Yay or nay, all right? It's pretty easy. I got it out of John Maxwell's book on dreams and living your dream. So here it is. The ownership question. Is my dream really my dream? Is my dream really my dream? Am I living somebody else's dream or is this my dream? Okay, that's fair. How about this number two? Clarity question. Do I clearly see my dream? Is it so clear in my head that I can articulate it and write it down? Number three, reality question. Am I dependent upon factors in my control to achieve my dream? I think these are great questions. In other words, let me, let me say it this way. 
I'm in control of my schedule, and if I, need, if I feel God's calling me to write a book, then I need to make the sacrifice. Is that in my control? Yes, that's in my control. That is in my control. All right? That is in my control. Are there some things in my world that aren't in my control? Absolutely. But that one happens to be in my control. Look at this next one. Does my dream compel me to follow it? Does it compel me and push me? Hey, listen, here's the truth. If it doesn't compel me, it isn't going to compel others to follow my dream. How about this? Do I have a strategy, strategy to reach my dream? Do I have a strategy? Am I working on it? How about this? Have I included the people I need to realize my dream? Have I connected myself to the right people to make it happen? How about this? Am I willing to pay the price for my dream? Ooh, that's a big one. I want to write a book, but I don't want to stay up late. I don't want to spend no time in front of the computer. I just don't want to do it. Can I get somebody else to do it? No. Mm -mm. No. Are you willing to pay the price for your dream? If not, don't be upset. How about this? Am I moving closer to my dream? How about this one? The fulfillment question. Does working toward my dream bring satisfaction to me? Does it bring satisfaction to me? Is it making me feel like I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And here's the ultimately, ultimately the, probably the greatest one. Does my dream benefit others? What's your motive? What's you after? If you can go through all 10 of those and say yes, 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 then you're pursuing your dream. But if you find one or two or three or maybe like me, five, of those that you're like, you know what, I really should do something about that, then that's probably why your dream isn't coming to pass because you're not doing everything you should be doing on those levels. Come on, y'all hearing what I'm saying? So now, let me give you a, a, a little bit more insight on this. You ready? What does it take? That's the, to me, this is kind of the, uh, the foundation for living out your dream, really more of a mental aspect. But what does it take spiritually to live out your dream? What does it take spiritually out of you? Well, here's what I believe, all right? If you're taking notes, write these down, all right? Number one, our heart's here. Our heart's here. Our heart's here. Listen to this. It says, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the what? Desires of your, of your heart. See, okay, everybody say, my heart hears. Come on, say it one more time. Say, my heart hears. See, a lot of times we don't think our heart hears. We don't think our heart hears because we think we're selfish. We think it's about us. We think it's this. We think it's that. When really, truly, most of the time, your heart hears from God. You, you second guess it, but it really does. Give me an example with me. Whenever I was in Bible college, everyone wanted to put me in youth ministry. If you want to kill a youth group real quick, fast in a hurry, put Charlie up in there. All right? Because in my world, it's like, hey, little crumb snatcher, sit down. Shut up. Pastor Charlie, we play games. I know we're going to play a game. It's called How Fast Can You Find the Scripture that I'm going to expound on. That's the game we play. Well, is there a prize? No, the prize is in heaven. <laughs> Come on. It, it, I was terrible at it, but everybody tried to put me there because I was young. I wanted to, to serve God. And, and the whole time I was serving, I in my heart, felt like I was called to pastor and lead a church. I felt that the whole time. Never once have I ever felt like I wasn't supposed to be doing that. Never once. But I did feel like I was doing those things, thinking, well, this is what I got to do to get to where God's called me. All the while torturing everybody along the way. <laughs> All right? So, so, so we, I, I'm doing this, and I'm like, I just don't really feel it. And, and here's what my mind was telling me. My mind was telling me, you just want to be a pastor because you want to be in charge. You just want to be a pastor because you want to do it your way. You, and, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to lie. There's an element of that that is true in the sense of if, you, if you're in front of me and you're not leading the church, get out of the way so somebody else can lead. If we're leading but going nowhere, we're not leading. That's called a walk by yourself. For leadership to be applicable, you have to be going somewhere and moving. 
Come on, talk to me in here. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So I find it hard to follow people that aren't going anywhere. Now, if you're going somewhere, count me in, baby. I'll be your support. I'll back you up. I'll sh Man, it's all good. But bless God, you got to be doing something. Amen? I love it because the Holy Spirit is our guide. A guide leads you. God is not stationary or stagnant. He's moving forward. Always. I got a whole series on it. You ought to listen to it. It's good stuff. <laughs> forward. But listen to this. Delight yourself in the law of the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. How does God lead us? Hearts. He leads us from our heart. The whole time I'm serving in other ways, and I'm not saying those were bad experiences in the sense of it gained me some experience, but can I tell you, I was never really fulfilled in those. I was just fulfilling those because everybody else thought I should be doing that. It wasn't until I felt like, man, I am called to start a church. I am called to plant this thing. I am called to grow this thing. I am called to do church the way I think church should be done, praise, praise God, and that's the way we're going to roll. And, and, and maybe there's some selfishness in that, maybe in the background of that, but can I assure you that wasn't my motive? My motive was, I've seen it done wrong. Let's do it right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I've seen church meetings turn into hurting people. I, we, I remember one time it was over the nursery carpet. Everybody talking about, we, we need to get nursery carpet, carpet in the nursery. And, and I was like, what? Why are we voting? Why are we debating? Why is everybody that's not serving in the nursery have a say? How about this? Until you get a poopy diaper, you don't have no say. Come on, y'all hear what I'm saying? Why does this have to be a debate? Let's just fix it and move on, right? Come on, y'all hear what I'm saying? And that's the way I saw it. And because of that, don't expect people to understand what you understand. You know what I mean? I was like, why do we do it that way? Well, that's just the way we do it. That's silly. Who's in charge of the nursery? You are? Yeah, go get carpet. <laughs> Let us know when you get back. We'll get somebody to install it. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Come on, you might know what I'm saying? It's that simple, y'all. It's that simple. But follow your heart. Follow your heart. God will lead you th through your heart, okay? Don't ignore your heart. Follow your heart. Here's the second one. You ready? Let God's word speak. Anybody remember that song? Word of God speak. Wouldn't you be? Y'all don't recognize that. I know, I know, I know, I know. But, but let the word speak to your heart. It's the word of God speaking to your heart that will clarify your call and what your assignment is. It's the word of God. The word of God will speak and it'll clarify where God's called you to be. The word of God. Whenever I was, before I started the church, I kid you not, I had, I, I, I'd be reading the Bible, I'd get so fired up, and I still got some of these tapes, uh, cassettes. I didn't, I, some of you were like eight track, no, cassette tapes, all right? But here's the truth, you ready? I'd get so fired up, I'd go to my garage and preach to myself on a, on a recorder. I preached my first messages, I was good too, in the garage, <laughs> preaching to myself, preaching to myself, right? Because every time I'd open the Bible for, uh, God's word would speak and I'd be like, man, I'm called to preach it. So I'm going to start preaching it. God speak, God speak, God's word speaks. And I tell you, it just fed me and fed me. And I know to you and to even me in my garage with the tape recorder, listening to myself preach is silly. But you know what? It's not silly now. It's not silly now. Because it was God's. I kid you not, after we started the church, the first six months, I didn't have to prepare a message. Why? I had about six months on reserve. <laughs> I'd preached them in my garage. I'm not exaggerating, man. And I still think some of those messages are some of my best. You want to know why? I wasn't preaching, so all I had time to do was simply study. So I'd go deep, deep, deep into one. John chapter five, I could preach John chapter five, the pool of Bethesda, like nothing. Why? I studied that for months. Five is the number of grace. Bethesda means house of grace. God's house is a house of grace. Five, the grace of God flowing in it. Do you want to be made well? You, Bryce, take your bed and walk. Jesus, I, I break it down for you. You know what I mean? House of grace, Bethesda, means place of outpouring. I got all that back then. 
You see what I'm saying? Now, I preach it still today every once in a while, but, but I'll be honest with you. I try not to preach any message more than once. Why? It forces me to continue to grow in God's word because I want God's word speaking, not just then. I got to live on today's word. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day, not yesterday's. I mean, if you like stale bread, nobody wants no stale bread. So I try not to preach anything that I've ever preached before. As a matter of fact, you will very, very rarely, maybe it's been five times in all the time of the 15, 16 years of the church's history that I've preached something more than once. All right? It's rare. Okay? And it has to be God speaking. Oh, well, here's the third one. You ready? Here's the third one. So we got God's word speaking to us. Here's the, here's the third one to live out our, we have to have prayer that guides us. Prayer that guides us. Uh, think about it like this. Anybody got an iPhone? All right, two. Yeah, we're getting there. All right. How many of you got an iPhone with a compass on it? All right. Have you ever tried to use that thing? If you ever try to use it and you get it to work, good luck. If you were stranded in a, in a woods trying to get out of the woods, been there, don't use that thing. Because it'll, when you pull it up, it'll, you got you to gotta, you gotta do this with it to calibrate it. That, you might as well put it in your pocket and keep walking. You wasted your time doing this with that thing. All right? Because it, it doesn't work. It does not work. That compass in that phone, I don't care what anybody says, does not work. All right? You'd be better off with a camping app and walking in the direction it'll show you. That app does not work. Now, I say all that to say it's so important, though, at the beginning, uh, when you open up the app, it'll, it'll tell you to calibrate it. And it's a waste of time. Now, here's the kicker of it. When you do tra uh, a camp or if you were in the military or anything like that and you use a real compass, it is important that a compass is calibrated. Very important. Why? That way you know where true north is. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Now get this. I liken it this way. Prayer really is like me calibrating my heart before the Lord. It's the calibrating. It's the calibration. I go to God and I begin to pray and I begin to ask God and show, Lord, show me, speak to my heart, so on and so forth, having a conversation with God. And it's amazing how God will take and turn my heart in a direction that he wants me to go. See, if I never go to God and I don't have a prayer life, then my heart is never calibrated, so I'm all over the place. But as soon as I spend some time with God and I calibrate my heart, it's amazing how he'll dial me into where I need to be. It's almost like, like a compass that it tell, he, whenever I pray and whenever I have this prayer life going on, then guess what? I don't have to worry about which way north, south, east, and west are. I know where true north is, and that's all I really need to know, and I know where to stay away from. By having a prayer life. By having a prayer life. If you don't have a prayer life, what's going to happen is your heart is never really truly calibrated. And because of that, you're never really going to know what to stay away from and what not to stay away from. The Lord spoke this to me years ago. I thought it was so awesome. He said this, you can do all things, but that doesn't mean all things are good for you. I'm going to give it to you, Charlie, rather the way he said it to me. You ready? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, you can do that, but I don't mean you should do that. Come on, y'all hearing what I'm saying? How do you get there? Through prayer. Asking the Lord. Asking the Lord, no doubt about it. Here's the bottom line. Here's the last one, and I believe this for sure. It is faith, though, that fuels you. Faith fuels you when it comes to your dream. Faith is what fuels you. Hebrews 11:6 6 says this, but without faith it is impossible to please him for anyone who comes to him must believe he is and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I love Hebrews 11:1 1 that goes along with it. It says, but, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things which are not seen. Well, listen to it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. A dream. The evidence of things which are not seen. Where does that evidence reside? On the inside of you with a dream. And then it goes down to Hebrews eleven six. 6. For without faith, without that dream on the inside, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible. 
For anyone who comes to him must believe he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So when you put it all together, here's what I'm trying to say, and I hope you're getting this out of it. Number one, your heart hears from God. Your heart hears. What is God speaking to you about your dream? What is God saying to you? What is he saying? What is he speaking to you? What is he saying about what you've been called to do and called to be? Some of you, maybe you've went and you've got all this education in an area that you don't even feel like you're called to. I tell you, God will take care of you. What's your heart? What's God speaking to you? What's the word speaking to you? What's God's word saying about that? Because I promise you, whenever God wants to speak through his word, it's emphatic. You can't help but hear it. Next part, prayer guides you. What are you praying? What is God leading you towards? And then ultimately, faith fuels it. If you're not putting faith in it, then I promise you, you're not going to be fueled for the dream and the passion that you have. You got to put faith in it. But when you combine all those together, can I assure you of this? You're going to live and walk closer to your dream each and every day. Amen? Amen. I believe that with all my heart. You're going to believe, you, you, you're going to see that dream come to pass. I know, I think about just me leading the church and all the stuff that we've done and are doing. You know what I mean? Right now, you know, we're believing for to add on to the new edition and all that we did last year. Man, it's been a great last couple years, several years for the church. But over the next few, we're not living on yesterday's word. We're living on tomorrow's faith and dream. And you know, our heart needs to hear God. Our, the word needs to speak. Prayer's guiding us and faith is going to fuel us. We, we, we got to stay in that mode. Amen? And it'll do the same thing for you. It'll do the same thing for you. Why are you blessed? Give the Lord a big clap. Praise God.